It matters what we say. Words matter. In her memoir, The Whisper Test, Mary Ann Bird writes, I grew up knowing I was different, and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate. And when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When schoolmates asked, what happened to your lip? I'd tell them I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. I was convinced that no one outside of my family could love me. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade who we all adored, Mrs. Leonard. She was short, round, happy, a sparkling lady. Annually, we had a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in the class, and finally it was my turn. I knew from past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something, and we would have to repeat it back. Things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? I waited there for those words which God must have put in her mouth. Those seven words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in a whisper, I wish you were my little girl. It matters what we say. Words have incredible power to heal, to inspire, and to tear down. Words can create realities and can open up new worlds of possibility. Yet we are often so careless with our speech. In the book of Genesis, in the Bible, we are told that God created the world with words. It says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Do I think there's literally an anthropomorphic God that used a voice in order to create everything? Not really. But do I think that words have the power to create reality? Oh, you bet. In many ways, we create the world we live in with our words. Later in the book of John in the Bible, it says, In the beginning was the Word. Most things begin with words. Someone says, Do you want to start a business? Or a children's museum? Or a hospice choir? And that's the spark that begins something completely new. Of course, sometimes when, there's, when the response is, Are you crazy? That is the stupid idea. You can't do that. You're not smart enough, or rich enough, or beautiful enough, or creative enough. Those words can also create a reality of failure for the person who hears them. But I want to be really clear this morning before I even get into this topic that I'm not talking here about magical thinking. I'm not saying that we can be anything we want to be and do anything we want to do if we choose the right words. It's not like that. No matter how many times I may say it, no matter how much I might desire it, I'm not going to be a giraffe. It's not going to happen. Right? David's not so sure. He's gonna... <laughs> Yet there is a lot within the realm of possibility through which our words can create amazing change, new things, new beginnings, new creations, beyond limitations that we often don't realize. And naming something often creates a starting point or a vision that we can live into or live up to. The author of the book, uh, The Art of Possibility, Benjamin Zander, he has this concept he calls giving an A. He says that one way to get 
out of the realm of limitation and competition is to give everyone an A grade from the beginning. Now, when I first heard this, I thought it was kind of ridiculous. But I've come to see that it's actually quite brilliant. Truthfully, just because we give someone an A doesn't make them suddenly exceptional. But what it does is it transforms us, the person who's giving the grade. And once we're transformed, the relationship shifts and the person has a new possibility to live into. Giving others an A, which means seeing the other person as successful and capable and exceptional, changes the only person we really can change, and that's ourselves. However, if we look back at the story that I began with of Mary Ann, who was born with a cleft palate, the way her teacher saw her changed Mary Ann forever. Our attitude about a person can have a powerful effect on that person. Now, as far as leadership goes, Xander says that leaders must never underestimate the power of those that they lead to realize what it is that the leader and the community dreams of. And he uses as an example Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we celebrate this month. He said that, what if Dr. King said, I have a dream, but I don't know if they're really up to it? No. Not Dr. King. Talk about giving people an A. Dr. King, inspired by Jesus, taught his followers to love their enemies. He knew that hate only begets more hate, and that it's love that has the power to transform. And so King taught the people that he was working with to love those who were hitting them and spitting on them and blasting them with fire hoses and epithets. He knew that if those who were protesting for civil rights responded to their opponents with hate in their hearts, that their opponents would go home feeling justified in hitting them. It's a lot easier to hurt people who we feel hate us. But if the civil rights protesters approached the opposition with love in their hearts and without raised hands or fists or weapons, then the police and the others who hit them down would have to live with themselves at the end of the day. They would eventually have to go home, tuck their children into bed, and they'd be carrying images of themselves in their minds, beating nonviolent and otherwise loving and gentle people. He believed that such love would transform the conscience of the perpetrators of the violence and the prejudice. If that's not giving someone an A in advance, I don't know what is. And what's amazing about it is it worked. It changed the course of history, and it changed every one of our lives. Do you realize that we all walk around every day in a trance of sorts? What I mean by that is, if someone tells you, you, tells you that you're inferior or superior, and you believe it, then that becomes real for you, whether it's true or not. It's like a trance. And we end up walking through the world almost hypnotized, believing in, believing in something that's not true. But we live it. We all believe things in any given moment that we're going to find out later are not true. You believe something or some things right now that you're going to find out at some point later are actually not true. So we all live in some way in this state of trance or hip hypnosis or whatever you want to call it. We used to think that Pluto was a planet. Now we don't, because someone told us. You probably used to believe in Santa Claus, and I'm sorry if I just ruined that for anybody. <laughs> but on a more consequential level, Let's get back to the story of Marianne one more time. This little girl, girl born with a deformed lip and face, who for years thought she was unlovable, 
Until one day, an adult who she adored broke the spell by telling her that she was special. In fairy tales, often, true love's kiss breaks the spell. What Mary Ann's teacher, Miss Leonard, did was she expressed true love. And in doing so, she broke the spell. I can remember when I was in middle school, when I was struggling with my work and with my grades, there was this period when I thought that I was, I just thought I was dumb, pretty much. I was, I was convinced that I was definitely below average in intelligence and probably wasn't going to amount to much compared to my peers and others around me. Those of you who know me know that I've since graduated from Harvard University with a graduate degree and all the other things that I've done in my life. But at that time, when I believed that, it's who I thought I was. I was in a trance. It's how I saw the world. Jer I was talking to Reverend Davis about this the other day, and he, he was telling me a story about a woman who he met. He used to do a ministry, a jail and prison ministry, and he was at a conference of ministers who did this, and there was a there was a street minister there from the community that was hosting this conference from all over the nation, and he invited any of the ministers who wanted to come out to the streets for this uh, for this to see what he does in his ministry with people, and so a bunch of them went out there the next day with him for this service that he was going to have on the streets. Well, this woman who who he was telling me about, she had polio. And she has wo had worn a brace on her leg all her life. And before the service even began, he looked at her and he said, what are, you, what are you doing with that brace? He said, God has healed you. Take off that brace. And she took off the brace. And unbelievable to her, she could walk. And she walked all around. She walked that entire day with so much joy in her heart. It was an amazing day, she said. When she got back to the hotel later that evening, her legs started hurting again. She ended up having to put the brace back on in order to walk. When Gerald met up with her, it was the next day she had the brace back on. She was wearing it. She's been probably wearing it the rest of her life. But she talked about that experience. She said, it was the most amazing day. It didn't hurt. I walked everywhere. I was so filled with hope, and it was such an incredible. She, she wasn't resentful. She wasn't feeling like she'd been tricked. She just said, it was amazing. I believed, and I lived into it, and it was amazing. In childhood, when we're little kids, we are completely susceptible to the words and the suggestions of our parents and the adults around us. It's almost like, you know, when a hypnotist does their work, they bring you to a state where you'll be susceptible so they can plant something in your subconscious so that you, so that you will think something differently. We're like that. We, as kids, we're sort of in a state of where we are so open to the suggestion of the adults and the parents and the family that we're in. And we live in a family which tells us a story about who we are and who they are and what the world is. Our parents or our guardians, they define our reality at that point in our lives. And as children, we have to buy the story. If we don't buy the we have to buy it in order to survive within the family. So much like hypnosis, and as some of you have probably seen or heard about the stage performing hypnotist who will bring some sorry guy up from the, from the audience in Las Vegas or something and hypnotize him and then tell him he's a chicken and he goes clucking around you know, the stage for a while. Until, uh, until the hypnotist snaps his fingers and takes him out of it, right? Well, when we're raised and we're young and we're told who we are by the people who we respect, that's who we believe we are in all parts of our being and know not, nothing different. When, if you're a smith and your parents say, you're a smith and the smiths don't always do everything the way everyone else does them, but we always succeed and we never complain, then that's who you believe you are. Or if you're raised in a family that tells you never trust anyone outside of the family and never share your dirty laundry with anybody, then you learn to follow the instructions or else pay the consequences. 
However, once we grow up, if, if we realize that actually, no, that's not who I am, that's not how I see the world, that's not how I imagine my life, we risk being ostracized from our own family for not agreeing to the family story. A parent might say, what do you mean you're not going into the family business? We all do this in our family. Or they might say, what do you mean you're not marrying an Italian girl or a, or, or a uh, Jewish girl? Or what do you mean you're not marrying a girl? <laughs> or whatever you're supposed to do. <laughs> to go against the family story is often a, like a form of blasphemy. You what? And it, it's, it can be very, very um, divisive for, for families, depending on how people respond to it. And religion is the same way. We are raised in a religious tradition when you're raised in one, and you're told from the time that you're very young that you're part of a story. For a while, at least, if not for your whole life, you believe that's the story. That's the way the world works, just how it was presented to you. And... If you dare to question the story, you take the risk of being shunned or shamed or cast out. I suspect that many people stay within a religious tradition long after they stop believing it for the sole purpose of not wanting to be rejected or in exile from their own family and their own community. It's understandable. All this is to say that a huge percentage of reality is made up simply of how we perceive it. See that baby crying? That's kind of how I feel about that sometimes. <laughs> Amen to that. Right? But so much of our reality is how we perceive it, and that's one of the reasons why the words are so powerful. Because words create realities, and if someone believes that God created the world and said it was good, then they believe it's a good world. And if someone believes that humanity is wretched and depraved and sinful at its core, then that's the world they live in. Unless someone or something breaks the spell. In 2014, I hope that you wake up to some untruths that you are inevitably living in your life. And I hope that you use your words to create positive possibilities for yourself and for others. We are told that in the beginning was the Word. What is the Word that you are beginning this new year with? <laughs>